a bit night nighttime storytelling here with the streets are quiet. Um, a lot of the spirits come out at this time of night as well. I'm on Cannon Street here. It's probably the best street in the town to give you some idea of the history of the settlement after the Columbans arrived and built in the town here in the 800s. So we'll have a little look around the streets. In here is Suffolk Street here, which junctions onto Cannon Street. And Suffolk Street is important as it's the very first street name mentioned on record in, in the history of Kells, known as the Aunt Suffolk. And that was burned in the 10th century by raiders. Um, from the monastery as far as the Shuffolk was burned. Now what's interesting about the Shuffolk is in, nobody actually knows where the term comes from, but quite possibly in Old Irish there's the term a Shuffolk, which is a fairy fort. And right until the 19th century, at the very bottom of Suffolk Street on Bechtel Square, there was a very large mound or hill, as I say, that was only removed in the early 19th century. Columbans had been around this area since the late 6th century, probably since the time of Column Kill or soon after. But it was here they built the main monastery in, in the 9th century for political necessity. Kells was at the very heart, right along the border between the powerful Northern O'Neills in Ulster and the Southern O'Neills who controlled Meath. Between them they controlled half of Ireland and Kells became a political and religious power base. Their church was the church of St Column Kill. Column Kill was their patron saint, not St Patrick, and Column Kill himself was an O'Neill. Heard of the big Viking raids on Kells, but uh, they weren't the only attacks on Kells. Probably the biggest Viking raid was in 951, when the Vikings were at their peak. They attacked Kells um, in large numbers and supposedly spent the summer here, encamped here, and took away 3,000 prisoners back to Dublin, which was the biggest slave market in Europe at the time. And people from around this area a thousand years ago could have ended up as far away as this Byzantine Empire um, under the Muslims in Spain or in North Africa or anywhere else in Europe. But it wasn't just the Vikings that attacked Kells. And Kells in the space of between 800 AD and probably uh, the time the Normans arrived in Ireland in 1169, Kells was attacked 50, 60, 70 times. In 1144 it was attacked three times in the one year. That wasn't the Vikings, they were native attacks. Who took power in 1002 after 500 years of the O'Neills. The O'Neill power began to decline and with it the authority of the Columban Church. Now Brew himself was very much a St Patrick's man and he marched north through Kells on several occasions to give prominence to St Patrick's Armagh over the Columban Church of Kells. Now St Patrick and Armagh were Roman. Uh, St Colum Kill and his people were native Irish church. And in the end, who's to argue with the popes? Um, it all came apart for Kells really in the 12th century after the, the O'Neill kings, the clan Coleman kings of Meath, um, they pretty much began infighting and in 1073 in the tower here, one of the heirs to the, to the throne of King of Meath, kingship of Meath was murdered by his own cousin. Now his cousin was murdered by another cousin after that but it really was the beginning of the end for the Columban church in Ireland and for the O'Neill's authority in Ireland as well. Um, the O'Rourke's of Breffney were regularly attacking Kells by the early 1100s and there was very little defence coming from, from, from the southern O'Neill kings. In 1117, Aid O'Rourke, the chieftain of, of the O'Rourke's of Breffney, were very high sept in the royal house of Connacht. He attacked Kells and all about the church were killed. Five years later, in 1122, the title of Corrib Column Kill, or head of the Columba church, it left Kells after 250 years and moved to Derry. But don't worry, we got Aid O'Rourke a couple of years later. They got him out the road there, past Carlinstown, and done away with him. It is known as Cannon Street, nothing to do with any boom boom cannons. But in the 1140s, when things were changing and the Columban church was pretty much on its knees, the Irish leaders started introducing European religious organisations into Ireland, a bit like joining the EU. Right behind these buildings here, the Augustinian canons set up a European order and very pro-Roman and that's why this is called Cannon Street. Now you can't see it in the dark but we know there's a small tower as you see when you walk up the street, a small tower in the field just behind and this was more likely part of the Augustinian monastery than actually anything purpose built for the defence of the Kells walls. But by the 1400s the Augustinians themselves had been driven out and a report from Kells in the 
about 1420 says it's an ill-walled town with a, a, a monastery laid to waste. is where the Cannon Street Gate would have stood uh, right on the western edge of the town leading out and beyond that leads out to the Old Castle Road to the west which was rebel country um, and for hundreds of years after the Normans arrived here that rebel resistance continued around here for a long time. In 1595 Hugh O'Neill and his army from the north attacked all of Mead and attacked Kells and destroyed all about here. Now just a year later actually in February uh, in February 1596, the O'Reillys attacked Kells en masse in the middle of the night. Um, the cavalry had already been called out somewhere else and they arrived just back in time through the Dublin Gate at the bottom of the town to face the O'Reillys here on Cannon Street. And in the space of the battle, more than 40 O'Reillys were killed on Cannon Street and more than 35 heads were removed and sent to Dublin as evidence and for payment for dead rebels. Monastic Kells may have been forgotten by many, but it wasn't forgotten by the native Irish. In 1642, when the Irish rose in rebellion, not against Charles I, but against his Puritan Parliament, it was at Kells here that the Northern O'Neills, the chieftains over the all native over, over the native rebels, met with the Southern Irish, the Anglo Normans, uh, who were in control of the south of Ireland. They got a bishop's blessing in Kells here in 1642 for a holy war against Cromwell. Now what people don't realise as well is that in that churchyard is buried a lady called Gonflet and she was the daughter of one of the most powerful kings in Irish history, Flancina, who was very much based around Kells here. Gonflet married a guy called Niall Glundub and Niall was one of the northern O'Neills and Niall and Gonflet, their children became the O'Neills of the north, uh, the heirs of Tyrone and so that's one of the reasons they came down here to get the blessing from the church and to gathered together with the southern Anglo-Normans to fight the English. Today we have these very powerful strong walls that run the whole length and breadth of the monastery but these were only erected in the 1760s and 1770s after the walls of Kells had came down. Now remember this was very much a crown town in control of the English um, with a mainly Protestant population so once the walls of the town came down they still needed an inner defence and this is probably why these walls were erected in the first place. And uh, this was a wide open market square until the early 1700s. No buildings whatsoever and it was where the, the markets were held on a regular basis. But after the tailors took over Kells and they needed to develop the economy, the traders were offered permanent spots in the market square and so over a space of a few over a few decades they began to put up permanent buildings and you'll see there's a, a lot of different architecture on these uh, four streets market street new market street church street and cross street the gates of the old shambles now once the market had been moved off the market square here it had to go somewhere else and it went up to the top of the town once the walls were demolished up around the fair green was now used as the open marketplace for cattle etc. But when you bought a cow or a pig or something else it had to be slaughtered and it was brought down to what was known as the shambles, the butcher's area and uh, that's in there you went with your livestock and you had it butchered and uh, you brought away or sold off. Now the square tower behind me is obviously not part of the original monastic settlement but actually the ground floor, the very first floor of that large square tower was actually probably built in the late 12th century um, by Hugh de Lacey, the first Norman Lord of Mead and it was part of his chapel here in the town. Now later on in the, in the 16th century when the Protestant religion came to Ireland and it became the state religion the square part of the tower was built on top of the, the ground floor the 12th century part and then on top of that then in the late 1780s and or 1790s Thomas Taylor the Earl of Bechtif, he actually put the conical tower on the very top of it so it's typical of Kells upcycling recycling and carrying on we have the 12th century we have the 16th century and we have the 18th century all in one building after the end of the Napoleonic Wars after the defeat of Napoleon at Waterloo in 1815 the Irish economy and much of the British economy went into a bit of a free fall uh, when the war ended. And a lot of the troops, a lot of um, Wellington's troops were Irishmen and quite a number returned to Kells here after 1815 with no employment and no hopes. And so within a couple of years things turned pretty bad around here. And right behind me is Maguire's pub, which was originally 
the Fever Hospital, built in 1817 in Kells here, to deal with the increase in poverty and sickness, etc. Now, it continued, the, the problems continue to grow, so that within a couple of decades, the Fever Hospital had moved up to called the Bullring, with a purpose-built hospital built there um, in the 1840s. When, in the 1830s, uh, the British government sent uh, around commissioners to do a full report on the state of Ireland, and I mean everything, top to bottom, population, conditions, etc, etc. They reported back after visiting Kells, and they said the lodgings of the Irish in Cannon Street were the worst seen in the British Empire. Their 1836 report said that up to a dozen people were living in small cabins, some by eight foot by four foot literally, and keeping pigs in the cabins too to keep themselves warm. Many were naked and writhing on the floor with hunger and disease, according to the Commissioner's report. Now, just a decade later, when the famine hit, in 1846 a soup kitchen was opened here on Cannon Street, and the Irish and the locals rioted for three days at the opening of this uh, soup kitchen. It was reported to the House of Commons in England, and their query was, why did the Irish get so upset about charity? The response from Irish MPs was, this is our country, this is our land, we shouldn't be asking charity from anyone. The Commissioner's Report of 1836 also provided a record of all the jails in Ireland, over 300, and only one was coined the term a black hole, and that was in Kells here. That jail was probably in Lacey's Castle, which had stood for over six and a half centuries at that stage. So in the 1840s, a new RIC barracks and jail was built here, at the top of Cannon Street, probably using some of the materials from uh, the Lacey's Castle. But at this stage, the tide was beginning to turn, and post-famine, there was a lot of Fenian activity in the countryside around Kells. And in one report to the British newspapers, it was claimed that the Fenians or Irish rebels were actually shooting at the ladies. The truth behind that was the ladies of the local gentry were never brought out until their husbands started using them as human shields against the Fenian snipers. All what happened here in the 1840s, a famine, is actually a crime against its victims. It was a fortuitous genocide on behalf of the British. It showed the same tendencies in Africa, in Asia, in the Americas and in China throughout the 19th century. In 1833 they had the hypocrisy to abolish slavery. In the 1860s in the United States slavery was abolished with four million slaves freed. But post-famine Ireland there was still up to five million people landless and without basically any real rights and at the whim of their own landlords. And so the land issue became the burning question in Ireland. In 1879, the National Land League was formed under the governance of Michael Davitt and Charles Stuart Parnell. In 1881, the leaders were locked up in Kilmainham Jail and the women of the Land League took over. Most importantly, Parnell's two sisters, Fanny and Anna. And they realised the men, as good and boisterous as they were, had done very little real organisation for the National Land League and they set about putting together a set of ledgers listing all the families in need of rent money, all those evicted and all those in need of food. Effectively everything that was required to run the Land League properly. Now they called these set of ledgers the Book of Kells. Now most will argue that the National Land League proved to be the inspiration for the Land Reform Acts which came at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century that gave most of the land back to the Irish, at least to the small farmers initially. But uh, like Gornflet in the graveyard behind here, the story of the women in, in this particular instance was very much overlooked. And Anna and Fanny's involvement in the Land League was quietly watered down. And the Book of Kells itself, well that disappeared and was never spoken of again. But at least the people were on the way to owning the land again. Now the same year as the famine started in 1844, the rector of Kells, Church of Ireland rector of Kells and Archdeacon of Mead, Edward Stafford, had been living on the street here. But his house, his new house, Blackwater House, was finally completed just down at Magdalen Bridge. So three years later in 1847, at the height of the famine, his daughter Alice was born. She was born into a very, very liberal Church of Ireland family, which ironically had its, had its history way back in Cromwellian period in Ireland when in the 1650s, Captain James Stafford 
received large some large portions of land in this area in payment for services in the Cromwellian army in the 1640s and 50s. Now one branch of the family uh, settled down in Court Town in Wexford and did very very well politically and financially. Another branch of the family went into the religion business and so Alice's father, while rector of Kells, his own father, Edward Senior, was the Church of Ireland Bishop of Meath. Now, as I say, the land issue had been pretty much sorted out, but young Alice uh, had her own ideas. And if it wasn't for her efforts, in 1916, there would have been very few guns in the GPO or in the Dublin Rising. And Alice had been at the very heart of purchasing, supplying and delivering the guns delivered to Ireland in the Holt gun run. Alice herself went on to be a state senator in the first free state senator of Ireland, one of only four women. But again, ironically, she comes from this Church of Ireland Cromwellian family. Her own niece, Dorothy Stoppard Price, she was an ardent IRA woman and she was against the treaty in 1922. Dorothy herself went on to be the forerunner, in fact, the leading light in the eradication of TB in Ireland in the 1950s. So, Here's Cannon Street for you now, all the way back to Gonflet, who was buried there in the 10th century, and up to the women a thousand years later, the Stopford women of Cannon Street. Things seem to go full circle around here, whether it be over the decades or the centuries and millennium. 10,000 years ago, hunter-gatherers from Britain and Northern Europe arrived here. 6,000 years ago, farmers from Britain and Central Europe. 4,000 years ago, the Bronze Age people of the Mediterranean and the Near East. Two and a half thousand years ago, the Celts from, from Central Europe and from Iberia. The Normans and the Vikings and those that followed. Uh, everything changes over and over again. And we survive everything that comes down the line, be it today, tomorrow or next year. Because Kells never stops. And on this street here, you can see the evidence for yourself. So the next time you come around these parts, take a moment to pause and think about all that have come before us and all that will come after us on Cannon Street.